Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the New Smyrna Beach Seventh day Adventist Church. We welcome our visitors. <laughs> This quarter we are studying the book of Galatians. I'm asked from time to time why aren't we using the quarterly? And the response is because I personally believe that God's word is inspired. Amen. I respect the work that the committee does in preparing the quarterlies. I personally prefer to go directly to the scripture and Amen. see exactly how and why God inspired the author, in this case it's Paul, the book of Galatians, why he inspired him to record the thoughts that he did and why Paul chose specific words to reflect the inspired thought that God had given him. So that's why we're studying the book of Galatians without the quarterly. Uh, we have been studying, spending two Sabbaths on each uh, chapter, and we follow the narrative as it's been given to us by the translators. Some of your Bibles have headings for each chapter. Some of them also have subheadings within the chapter. And that is the format that I have been following. Uh, we begin each uh, study by uh, asking the question, what is the heading or the subheading, as last week, uh, for our study today? We're studying today Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. And uh, let's begin as we have the last nine Sabbaths. Let's look up and see what your Bible has for a heading for Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Sons and heirs. Sons and heirs. Sonship in Christ. Sonship in Christ. That's what mine has. New American Standard. Where? And sons and heirs, I think, is the New King James. Anyone else have a heading for chapter 4 of Galatians? The subordinate status of an heir during his minority. Wow, that really gets right down to it. Our study last week ended with the thought expressed in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, where Paul says, uh, If ye be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. There you go. <laughs> what has Paul been writing to the Galatians about? For three chapters. Why does he end verse 29 that way? If, what does the word if mean? Since you sort of make a choice. We have a choice to make. If ye be Christ, then are you who? Abraham. Why does Paul end this way? What what is it that what is the issue that Paul is facing in Galatia? A lot of religious Jews there, and then he was born again. That was a big difference. Same thing today. Anybody that has a real spirit of God has something inside of them they're going to share with a, with a passion, not just reading a story. And they, the religious people, the Jews, they couldn't get it. Uh, Thank you. There's, there's a, a uh, concept out there that in the Old Testament we have literal Jews, the true uh, uh, people of God. In the New Testament we have spiritual Israel. Literal Israel, Old Testament, spiritual Israel, New Testament. The truth is, as Jones and Wagner said in 1888, Israel has always been spiritual. Abraham was always a believer in Christ. Hallelujah. And so in order to be a part of Israel, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, you need to believe in Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Excellent <laughs> remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> Why does Paul say what he does in Galatians 3.21? 29. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. Paul is addressing the argument that the false brethren have 
have been teaching the converts to Christianity from the heathen world, Gentiles if you prefer, and the converted Jews to Christianity. And now they're saying to these converts, unless you are circumcised, you will not be saved. And Paul says to them, and he says the same thing to the problems in Romans, Romans 4, 11 and 12, he says, your argument is not biblical. Because if you go to Genesis 15, 6, you find out that when Abram decided to say, I believe to God, when God said in a vision to him at night, God said, come outside, he's in a tent, he's in a vision, and God says to him, I want to show you how large a family I'm going to bless you and your wife with. At that time, Abram was 73 years old. His wife was 10 years younger. And what did Abram say? Amen. I believe you. And God said what? I declare you righteous. Amen. And that's the key. Because now, in chapter 16, 17, God says to Abram, okay, I'm ready to fulfill my promise to you in chapter 15, verse 6. What does Abram say? Whoa. Hang on. Uh, my wife Sarah suggested that I produce a baby with her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar. <laughs> and uh, I took her advice. And we have this little beautiful baby called Ishmael. So Paul develops this thought to these converts to Christianity and he reminds them of what God did in chapter 17 of Genesis. He says to Abraham, 99 years old, I want for you and all the male, males in your camp to be circumcised because I'm going to produce a baby. What is the point of circumcision as far as God is concerned? What is God trying to teach Abraham? What is Paul trying to get across to these Galatian converts? God. God does not need or want our help in fulfilling His promises to whom? Amen. That is the issue. That is why Paul concludes chapter 3. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to what? What promise? Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, where God made how many promises to Abram? Seven. Seven. Folks, this has an application to us today. Amen. If we don't understand this, we are going to repeat history. We do not want to repeat that aspect of the Galatian church's history. Amen.
Revelation 3 through 9. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, we, as Seventh day Adventists, well meaning, have associated the word heirs with the word remnant. Let's go and see what the inspired writers trying to communicate to us regarding heirs and remnant. Let's begin with Isaiah, Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 10, Isaiah chapter 10, when you're there say ready, ready. ready. and tell me if you have a subheading between verse 19 and 20. Uh, the what? Okay, uh, someone else? I heard another voice. Hope for the Lord's people. Who? Hope for the Lord's people. Hope for the Lord's people. Kindle, Prince. Right? shall return to the Lord. What? A remnant shall return to the ah. Lord. Ah. Who would like to read verses 20, 21, and 22? Oh, uh, Isaiah 10. In that day, the remnant left in Israel, the survivors in the house of Jacob, will no longer depend on allies who seek to destroy them, but they will faithfully trust the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. <laughs> Thank you. Right there. Stop right there, please. What is he talking about so far? God has allowed the Assyrians to what? Get Israel's attention since Israel is not willing to let God get their attention. God has a very effective way of getting our attention. But it's meaningless if we don't pay attention and learn from our experiences. Okay. Verse uh, 21. A remnant will return. Yes, the remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. But though the people of Israel are as numerous as the sand of the seashore, only a remnant of them will return. The Lord has rightly decided to destroy His people. Is that it? That's, that's it. It goes in 23. Hmm. Let me read verse 22 from my translation. New American Standard. For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. A destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. Isn't God amazing? Everything He does to us the experiences that permits in our lives, and when you want to correct it, correct us, what is the spirit in which he does it? Righteousness. Ellen White makes a comment that a, a primitive, uh, in the last stage, primitive godliness would manifest among God's people. And this is what it's talking about, this remnant. There's a, there's a group in Revelation 14, 1 through 5, that follow the land wherever he goes. They live by righteousness, by faith. And uh, unfortunately, most Adventists are not going to be saved because she said many will be lost, but not one in a hundred, and so on. And the reason is, Testimonies Ministers 4, 5, 6, it says, Justification by faith is the work of God in laying in the dust the glory of man. That's the part people don't like. See? So there's a, there's a humility that comes in having our righteousness, which is not just bad, but it's filthy rag. Amen. That means soil with excrement. It's terrible. Amen. Our righteousness is garbage. And we have to go through that process, brother. It's very humbling. Some people won't go through that. They refuse to repent. And so, as a result, but there's others who will embrace the righteousness of Christ like Abraham and rejoice and praise God for that righteousness. That's the remedy. I was asked once to preach a sermon. It was uh, Easter weekend. I was even given the title of the sermon. Very unusual title. How to be a remnant without being a snob. <laughs> The pastor of the church gave me the title. 
he had been studying with an evangelical scholar, and the evangelical scholar was having a lot of trouble with us and the way that we teach that the two goats represent one is who? Christ. And the other one is who? Satan. In the evangelical world, they teach that the two goats represent two aspects of Jesus' life. They cannot get it through their heads that one of those goats. So, I preached a sermon on that. And uh, the evangelical scholar introduced himself to me after the service. And he said, that's the first time that I've heard an Adventist explain this from Scripture that made sense. Praise the Lord. Folks, uh, we need to understand who are the remnant. The remnant is not speaking of a legal organization. It's speaking of a people that allow God to reproduce his character. And amen. Uh, a brilliant evangelical scholar, Australian, by the name of uh, Paxton, Dr. Jeffrey Paxton, wrote a book about Adventists. He knows Ellen White's writings backwards and forwards. He's very impressed with Ellen White. You know what the title of his book is? The Shaking in Adventism. And right smack in the middle of the book, he makes his statement. Will the real Seventh-day Adventists please stand up? Why do you think he made that statement? Because we have so many versions here about our being priests in our church. That's a legitimate statement to be made of about us. Who would like to read verse 1 of Galatians chapter 4? Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Uh, and verse 2 of the Apostle, please. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Okay. Until the heir reaches what? Maturity. Maturity. The Father is not going to turn over the inheritance over to him. Now, is this talking about the same situation with uh, Jacob and Esau, where the firstborn gets the what? Birthright. The birthright? Is this the same thing? No. That's right. What we're talking about here in verses 1 and 2 of Galatians 4 is until the biological heir matures, the father's not turning over what? So this has nothing to do with who's born first. This has to do with a condition. Amen. We need to understand that. Uh, volunteer to read verses 3, 4, and 5 of Galatians 4, please. So also we, while we were children, and were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Thank you. There is a lot there, and we need to address it. The first thing we need to understand is how the writer, or why the writer, chose the word children, and what does the writer mean when he uses the word children? Young. Is he speaking of chronological age? Immature and spirit. He's speaking of what? My condition. My condition. Redeemed from what? What do we what do we study in Galatians three thirteen? Christ has redeemed us from the what curse, curse. the curse of the law. 
What is the curse of the law? Second death. Death. But for what reason? For sin. <laughs> oh. And the word sin is being used again, not as a verb, but as an adjective, speaking of my condition. condition. That is the issue here. What? So, the term children is speaking of my condition before what? Who said converted? Before we were converted. Okay? Before we were converted. Uh, who would like to read for us Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Speaking the truth in love, they grow up in all things unto him who is the head Christ. From Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. Oh, I started with 15. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Again, speaking of what? Our condition. And what is it that Jesus has <coughs> redeemed us from? The curse. The curse of the law. What did we learn about the curse of the law when we studied two weeks ago Galatians 3.13? No flesh shall be saved. Let's take a look at Galatians 3.10. Galatians 3.10. Who would like to read that for us? For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Thank you. Technically, there's two ways of being saved. You can keep the commandments from the time that you were born, but if you mess up once, what happens? You're told. As far as the law is concerned. Yeah, toast is the right word. <laughs> the other way is to what? Receive God's righteousness. Through whom? Through Jesus Christ. Christ. That's it. There, there are, there's no third option. His righteousness kept the law from birth to the cross. Right. Amen. So, how else does the word children, how, how else is, is, as she read in verse uh, 4, what else does the, uh, the condition bring about? Bondage. Mm -hmm. Bondage. And it is from this condition that Christ came to what? Right. Deliver us. Right. Deliver us. Let's make sure that we understand what we're talking about here. Let's uh, go to, to the right, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Who would like to read Col Colossians chapter 2, verse 8? Brother, before we get off this point, can I say something? To put some energy into the what really happens when we're converted. There are spirits of evil that keep us pushed down. When you're born again, that spirit of bondage is taken from you when we accept Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul said in Ephesians 3.20, this is for those who have that. This is what's going to happen in your life. Now all glory to God who is able through His mighty power at work within us is able to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to Him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. There was a certain element of excitement because the Holy Spirit. We talk and tell these stories without the true presence of God's Spirit where it is our earthly interpretation. But I think that's what when we have that spirit, you're alive and you speak that word out of your soul because it's in you. We're not trying to get it. We already have it. I know that's the goal for everybody. But that's why our church, you know, Sister White says, if certain things would have happened, Christ would have came. But all these other Shabbat-keeping churches, there's 300 million people that worship God on Sabbath. 
in the world today. We're one group, the largest Shabbat keeping church. But there's God is working so many things, He called us out. But you know, one in a hundred is pretty it, it shakes me up when I read these things and hear them spoken without the real spirit of the living God. It's just talk like it was with the Pharisees. Okay. So what should we focus on? Being just excited or letting the Holy Spirit the Holy hang on, hang on. Yeah. What should we focus on? The Holy Spirit. And letting the Holy Spirit work on us as right. we need help. Does the Holy Spirit know the help that I need? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, we don't measure the Holy Spirit's work by the outward excitement physically because we all have different personalities. Very good. Amen. Amen. Okay? We focus by seeing the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in the main problem area that I have. Mm -hmm. The main problem area that I have is dying to self. Amen. 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 And the Holy Spirit knows just how to work me and how to get me focused on dying to self. Did Jesus understand his mission when he was here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, when Satan came to Jesus and tempted him three times after 40 days in the wilderness without solid food, what did Jesus, how did Jesus respond to Satan? It is written. The word. The word. Yeah, it is written. Well, here, here's, it's important to know what he said when it was written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Yes. That's important for us to understand. Why? Do you think that Satan needed to hear that from Jesus? Absolutely. Really? Don't you think that Satan knew that? You know. Satan knew that if he keeps us from the Word, seven days without the Word makes one week. <laughs> did Satan? Did Satan know who had created him when he yes. tempted Jesus three times? Oh yes. yes. Then why didn't Jesus say to Satan? You moron. <laughs> Have you forgotten that I created you up there? <laughs> now you're coming down here and you're going to tempt me three times? What's wrong with you? Have you just have you just reached a point of depravity that you've forgotten that I am the one that created you? You're coming to me now and tempting me three times? Why did Jesus do that? Why was Jesus, what was Jesus' mission on this earth? Because he answered him the same way over To conquer as we have to conquer. He came to set us free. Yeah, free. Over this, Satan. Over, over the world. The, the, the other reason is that Jesus knew who he was by faith. And what he was doing was attacking Christ's faith. Christ did not have a pre-memory or pre-knowledge of his existence. He lived totally by faith. He accepted who he was by faith. When he said, National live by bread alone, he was sharing his testimony. And that word man means Adam. And so he's the second Adam. And so he knew who he was by faith in Christ. And the devil was tempting him to break his faith. If thou be the Son of God. Yes. And so Christ couldn't just say, hey, listen, moron. I was, I'm the one that created you. <laughs> Christ didn't talk. He, he, lived, he, he, he believed who he was by faith. The same way we have to believe who we are in Christ by faith. Hallelujah. Yeah. Same idea. That's the faith of Jesus. Yeah. Also, you know, he had to use the same tools that we have. We don't have that tool to say, hey, moron, we created you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why God said, or Jesus said, it is written. Because that gives us the same weapon that we can use. He was our example. Amen. That we can use in this Very good. Who has Colossians 2, verse 8? I do. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, <laughs> according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Thank you. I saw a hand back here, but I don't know who it was. I okay. was going to make a comment about when uh, Satan was saying, if you be the Son of God, like, does the devil have a memory problem? He knew who he was. I've heard some, some uh, messages stating that... <laughs> You know, uh, with it being separated from God for just a short time, 
his memory, just like us, our memory deteriorates when you get old. But well, but we have a, a big question mark. <laughs> we have a promise from God that if we, uh, as circumstances permit, and whatever background we come from, we focus on this. God will bring to our memory Amen. when the time comes to use this. Yeah. Not only what to say, but how to say it. And let's turn to uh, let's turn to Romans chapter seven.